Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to a fun-filled afternoon of organic chemistry, Chem 170, with your host, me, Dr. White. If you want, turn on your webcams. I know one of you have already, so I can see your real people. It makes me happy. But anyways, you don't have to if you don't want to. All right, important announcement. Remember, tomorrow, after class, I will send out the password for test number two. You'll have until 10 a.m. approximately, give or take a few minutes, uh, Friday morning to take test number two and upload your answers as a single PDF file. It's just like you did test number one. I guarantee, and I'll say this again tomorrow, by Sunday 1 p.m., hold on one sec. That's better. I guarantee by 1 p.m. Sunday, I will have your test scores in D2L. I will also, sometimes by Sunday, if not earlier, and I might get the grades up earlier too, uh, I will send out an email to each and every one of you with the points you receive for each answer on test number two. And next Monday, I will go through test number two and all the answers. And, but I'll cut it out of the video because I don't want them floating around the internet for the rest of the time. And that's test number two. As I mentioned yesterday, you look on D2L. Last week, I sent out an email and also the announcement, what is covered on test number two and a point breakdown. But just to remind you, test number two will cover alcohols. It will cover thiols, you know, stinky stuff. And it will cover ethers, epoxides, really ethylene oxide reactions, and ketones and aldehydes. We've gone through all the problem sets. The best way to study is do the problem sets. And I've already done my review and that's posted on YouTube. If you want to see it, you can see me, your YouTube star. All right, any questions about what's going on next couple of days? And in case you forgot, don't forget tonight from five to six, if you need help, I will have my office hour. Cause as I see on my computer, it's Wednesday. It feels like a Tuesday, but it's Wednesday. So I'll have that. All right, let's get back to work. Oh, I should mention a lecture. I may go a little longer today and then we'll do the lab. And you'll get out by midnight. No, I'll get you out way before then. You know that. And with that, let's get to work. And yesterday I left you with a cliffhanger. And a cliffhanger was to talk about a new functional group. And that's called this part of the chapter, carboxylic acid derivatives. Derivative is a compound made from something else. And a carboxylic acid derivative are compounds, new functional groups made from carboxylic acids. And don't forget, a carboxylic acid is this general structure. So molecules made from this are called derivatives. And I'll never ask that. And that's where what normally happens, like almost always, you replace the hydroxyl group, OH, on the carbonyl. Remember, carbonyl, carbon double bond to oxygen, is replace the hydroxyl group with something else. Now, the key functional group and switches on that I will talk about is the ester. And you have your carbonyl, and my software doesn't like to put it in carbonyl carbons, and you replace it with an oxygen and R prime. And this is called an ester. A uh, cute story at the other school when I taught this one semester, I had a girl, a student, her name was Esther. And whenever I did this, when I did this chapter, Anytime I said Esther, her head was snapped. Did you call me? No, I'm talking about the functional group. All right, so this is an Esther. 
Now, unfortunately, I don't have enough time, so I will not be talking about this group. This is called an acid chlorohalide, where X can be chlorine, bromine, or iodine. And I've worked with mainly chloride myself, acid chlorides. Sometimes they're called acyl halides, like in your book, but most people call them acid halides. Other than the one reaction I showed you to make the aromatic ketones, I just don't have time this semester, you know, one semester course to talk about it. I'd rather spend more time on things you'd be interested in, like fats and oils, carbohydrates, and proteins. And I will, and I do. So what is an ester? It's something derived, meaning made from a carboxylic acid. That's where you replace the hydroxyl group with OR prime. Remember, R and R prime are just like X and Y. They can be the same or different. They have carbons and hydrogens. And these are esters. So how do you name an ester? Well, you name the R prime group bound to the oxygen as an alkyl group, and that goes in front. And then change the name of the carboxylic acid used to make the ester by dropping the IC and the word acid and adding ATE. Now, a couple of years ago, sorry, more than a couple of years ago, I had a very creative 170 student, and he came up with a modification of step two. And I'll teach you both this step, which I call step A, and step 2B. And immediately I say, to be or not to be, that's the question. Oh, I can't stop from saying that for those who know Shakespeare. But anyways, that's how you name Esther. So let's do some. First of all, what functional group is this? Look for what's different, what's not carbon, what's not hydrogen, to you get your attention like that, and also carbon, carbon, single bonds. And notice we have a carbonyl, carbon double bonded oxygen with carbons attached to it, oxygen. Then on that oxygen, I have more carbons, and this is an ester. So how do you do this? Well, one, if this were an H, that would be propanoic acid. And let's do it method one. Drop the IC from in the word acid from propanoic and add the letters A-T-E, propanoic. Say that five times quickly, no. And then the R prime, you put in the front the name of the alkyl group it is, which is methyl. So this is methyl propanoid. Now the student's method, and this uses 2A, and this uses B of two, because if I say to be, I gotta say to be or not to be, that's the question. I don't wanna be too obnoxious today. So how does the students work? What's the longest chain with the carb uh, carbonyl carbon? three, and that's propane. And now for his method, instead of adding A-T-E, you add O-A-T-E, propanoate. You get the same thing. What's our prime? Methyl. Now, where this breaks down is for the following molecule where you can't use the student's B2. And that is for this molecule. And now what's the longest chain? Oops, you got a benzene ring in there. How do you do this? You can only use method one. And here, if this were an H instead of an R group, that would be benzoic acid. 
drop the IC in the word acid, add ATE, and this is benzoate, and the R group in front, because this is an ester. is ethyl. So that would be ethyl benzoate. But for everything when R is not benzene ring in the ester, you can use my student's great idea. And it works quite well. So one other thing, if you have substituents on the R group, the carbonyl carbon of an ester is always one, always. And you name those. But this is going to get pretty, uh, how should I say, complex. So on this nice Wednesday afternoon, it's time for a gift from Dr. White to you. Would it rhyme? Anyways, sort of. Uh, Dr. White was never going to be a poet. Uh, but for test number, and this will be on test number three, esters, and the final, I will never put an alkyl group on the R group of an ester or on the R prime either. That's going to make your life just a little easier, but that's my special gift to you. Let me do one more. And the question is, what's the IUPAC name for this ester? Three points. How do you do that? Well, since our, what functional group is it? That's the first thing. I have a carbonyl, carbon double bond to oxygen, oxygen here with carbons. The carbonyl has carbons. They're different. This is an ester. Since R is not a benzene ring, we can use B2 of the student. And how do you do that? How many carbons in the longest chain with the carbonyl carbon? One, two, three, four, five. That's pentane. Drop the E, add O, A, T, E. I never say oat, O, A, T, E. And then what's our prime? That's our prime, and that's an isopropyl group. And that would be isopropyl pentanoate, and that's how you do it. Well, I better share. And why don't you try this one? What would be the IUPAC name for the following molecule? Three points each. Oh, look, you people have been trained by Dr. White to do the thumbs up and really thank you. In a class face to face, I can just look around and see when people are done. But on Zoom, especially when you don't have your camera on, I can't. All right, I think everybody's done. Let's do this. What's the functional group we have here? What's different? Ooh, carbonyl. It's got carbons on it. It's got an oxygen, and that oxygen has carbon on it. This is an ester. How do you name esters? Well, if you use the student's way, one, two, three, four. And that would be butane. Drop the E, add O-A-T-E. And now in the front, 
you put what R prime is and you name it as an alkyl group, and that would be methyl. So that would be methyl, <coughs> excuse me, butanoate. Oh, let's do another one. Remember, this is the exception. You can't use the student's method. And if this were an H, that would be benzoic acid. Drop the IC in the word acid and add ATE. So your turn. And I think everybody's done, so I better get to work. If we look at this molecule, what's different? Carbonyl with oxygen with carbons here and carbons here. And that's an ester. Oh, I can't use the students because that's an R group is benzene ring. So what would be the carboxylic acid of this group right here, our prime or hydrogen, that would be benzoic acid. Drop the IC in the word acid, add ATE, when you do it that way, as benzoate. And what's my R prime here? What kind of group? Dr. White's favorite or one of them, I love isopropyl too, and that would be T-butyl, or if you wanted to put tert butyl, you could T-butyl, benzoid. And that's how you do esters. Now, there's a functional group I talked about, but I didn't teach you how to name them. And what's that functional group? That's the carboxylate anions. And M for this class, ah, let's try that again. M for this class can be lithium, sodium, or potassium. And how do you do carboxylate anions? And why did you wait until now? Well, because it's similar to esters. Step one. Name the M plus as the element it came from in the front of the name of the molecule, just like our prime. And two, use 2A or 2B, or not to be, that's quite, I can't read the saying that, sorry. Uh, from the esters. So let's look how we do that. And what do we have here? A carboxylate anion. How do you know what's different? Carbonyl, ooh, oxygen, a minus charge, and a cation. In real life, it can be a lot of other cations, but for now, let's stick to that. So how do you name that? Well, since R is not a benzene ring, I can call it one, two, three, propane, 
and using the student's method, drop the E and add O-A-T-E, just like an ester. However, in front, what is N-A, and I hope you know that, sodium. So that would be sodium propanoate. And that's how you do it. Again, for carboxylate anions, I will not put an alkyl group on there. The carbonyl carbon would be one, but I'm going to keep it simple on the test. For those who want, after class, if you're interested, I'll show you how to do it with an alkyl group. And there you go. What would be the IUPAC name for the following? Three points each. And remember when you're done, give me a thumbs up. All right, anybody need more time? Always feel free to ask you do if you do. All right, I better get to work then. If we look here, what's different? Ooh, carbonyl, oxygen, a minus charge, a cation, and carbons. And what is this? First of all, M can be lithium for my class, sodium or potassium. And this is a carboxylate anion. And since R is not a benzene ring, I can do one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Let's do it again. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And that's heptane. But like an ester, drop the E, add O-A-T-E. And now for carboxylate anion, what element does LA plus, Li plus come from? Lithium. So that would be lithium heptanoate. Later in the semester, I'll teach you when we get into fats and oils how another lithium carboxylate is in the last, I'd say, eight, 10 years, has found heavy use as a lubricant in many things, such as the different parts of your garage door. If you have a garage door that you want to keep moving nicely, the wheels and uh, other moving parts on the door, use a lithium carboxylate anion and it works quite well. And you can get it at Home Depot and all those other places. All right, well, let's do one more. And here's the one more for you. Enjoy.
And don't forget, when you're done, I should have a tape recording made. Or better yet, flash on the screen. When you're done, give me a thumbs up. All right, I think everybody's done, so I better get to work. What's different? Carbonyl. It's got carbons on it, the benzene ring, oxygen with a negative charge, and a cation. And for this class, M plus is, or M, I should say, is lithium, sodium, or potassium. So how do you do that? Well, here you have to use the IUPAC rules. What carboxylic acid would this come from? If this were an H instead of a cation and a negative charge, that would be benzoic acid. Drop the IC in the word acid, add ATE, benzoate. And what element does Na plus come from? Sodium. Therefore, this is sodium benzoate. A bad habit of mine, I capitalize letters. And if you were keyboarding this, they still use the term type. I don't think so. They would all be lowercase, but I would never take off points for that on a test. Now, sodium benzoate, as I talked about earlier, now you know how to name it. Next time you have a chance, look at a can of pop or a bottle of pop. Remember, Dr. White's from the Chicagoland area. I lived here all my life, except when I lived in Michigan for getting my PhD, East Lansing, go Michigan State. But anyways, uh, we call the stuff in a can or a bottle that's carbonated, non-alcoholic pop, not soda. If you look near the end of the label, you will see sodium benzoate, and that compound is put into our pop to preserve it. How that does that, I have no idea. I'm an organic chemist. I have no idea how that preserves it, what it preserves it. But I know if I have my favorite stuff, do I, do I have time? Oh, I do. My favorite two pops, one you already know, you're, you're familiar with, and that's Dr. Pepper. The other one is Everybody see the Verners on your screen? If you've never had that, you're missing it. It is a very spicy, carbonate, highly carbonated ginger ale. That doesn't really taste like ginger ale, but it's sort of. And the only place I know where to get it easily is at Jewel Food Store. Not that I get any kickbacks from Jewel. They used to sell it at Dominic's, but that's long gone. And I've never looked for it in Tony's or some other places but I can always get it in Jewel. And in my utility room downstairs, I have, I think at least two unopened cases and a partial open case of Werner's because I really like it. Now for the fourth, I treated myself to another one, not overdoing pop. I got some A&W cream soda. If you've never had cream soda, you're missing something great in life too. But back to organic chemistry. Well, when I was a kid, they used to, if you went to a, a deli or a restaurant where they made their own drinks like this pop, we used to call it a vanilla phosphate. Why I got that name? And they also had chocolate phosphates, which I didn't like, by the way, this is a good brand too, but it's too expensive. But anyways, let's get back to organic chemistry. Now, there are two nomenclature skills. You should have an organic chemistry, meaning I can ask on a test. One is, here's the molecule, draw the structure. The other is, here's the name, draw, or here's the molecule, give the IUPAC name. The other is, here's the name, draw the structure. So 
So how do you know what to draw when you see ethyl hexanoate? All organic molecules, you start from the right and move to the left. Now, OATE immediately tells you it could be an ester or it could be a carboxylate anion. Now, how do you tell the difference? You look in the very front, you don't see the name of an element, it's a ester, which this is. If that were E, it would be six carbons. The end carbon, I always do it on the right, you can do it on the left, but I do it on the right because good habits, Dr. White, doesn't break carbonyl oxygen. And what's my R prime, what's ever in front? And that would be ethyl. One, two, three, four, five, six, plus an ethyl group. And there's four bonds to carbon. And there you go, ethyl hexanoate. Let me do one more. and that's potassium octanoate. How do you know what to draw? You start from the right and move left. OATE tells me either ester or carboxylate anion. But if you see in the front here, I have the name of an element. So I know I have a carboxylate anion. And this were an E, octane, eight carbons. And that's including the carbonyl carbon. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. At the end, right or left, I'll always do the right. It's carboxylate, car, uh, carbonyl group. Then since it's a carboxylate anion, you have an oxygen with a negative charge. And what's the cation? Potassium. Now, if you don't want to show charges, put O and then the letter K. That will be okay with me. Oh, I just made a funny. Wasn't that funny, but I enjoyed it. And that would be potassium octanoate. And now it's your turn. And that would be draw the structure for n propyl hexanoate. Oh, I see the thumbs coming up right and left. So that means I better get to work. How do you decode this? You start this way, see OATE, that could be ester or carboxylate anion.
And some people call, I don't, carboxylate anions, carboxylate salts, and they are. All right, if this were an E hexane, six carbons. And carbon, carbonyl, oxygen, then it's an ester because you don't see an element in front. And what's n propyl? Three carbons. The n carbon is attached to that. And why don't you try one more, <clears throat> excuse me, draw the structure for sodium decanoate. All right, anybody, everybody done? I only saw one thumbs up so far. Oh, I'm seeing more. All right, let's get the word. And the question is, how do you know what to draw when you see the name sodium decanoate? Start from the right, move left. OAT ending tells you either ester or carboxylate anion. When you see the name of an element, then it's a carboxylate anion. And for this one, since ours are not a benzene ring, I can say if the OAT were E, decane 10 carbons. And at one end, I like doing on the right, I have a carbonyl. <clears throat> and because of sodium, and it's a carboxylate anion, I have O minus. You don't have to put the charges, but I always will. And what's the cation? Sodium, Na. And now I've got to get to work putting in my hydrogens. And that's how you do it. Any questions? Remember a couple of weeks ago when you had trouble putting in hydrogens because you weren't brainwashed by me? There's four bonds to carbon. See how easy it's getting now? Hopefully it is. All right, let's continue on. Now, we're getting into some juicy stuff now. And esters are found in nature. Now, where do you find esters? You should know esters are responsible for the flavor and fragrance of many flowers and fruits. Uh, next time you're outside, if you smell, or if you're in a florist shop, if you smell a rose, you're smelling an ester. In fact, let's do something.
All right, everybody see the Wikipedia with all these different ester structures? Thank you, Joanna. And if we look at a couple of them, allyl, and that's where you have the R prime is three carbons with a double bond, is responsible for smell and taste of pineapple. If we look here, butyl acetate, and I'll talk about common names in a little while, is apple and honey. And another ester is also part of the apple, pineapple. And if we come down here, here's one of the esters along with the carbox uh, cinematic acid, but ethyl cinnamate uh, for cinnamon. Here's one for pears, the simple ester. And let's do, oh, let's move down. Here, fruity orange and another one orange, banana, apple. This amyl, also called pental acetate. Notice is an ester, each pendal line is carbon. This is mainly responsible for the odor of bananas. Next time you smell and taste a banana, I have to be honest, I hate bananas, but I still in the lab, we do a lab next week, we'll do uh, with esters. Unfortunately, we're not gonna do it face to face and students get to smell it. And one of the ones they make is this ester and they smell, oh my goodness, a banana. And they're shocked. We'll talk more about that next week. So next time you eat something like fruits or even vegetables, you're tasting and smelling esters. Now, one of the interesting things in mother nature is used for animals, but not humans, is what's called a sex pheromone. And the switch off on this, but the sex pheromone is an ester that the, usually the female of a species releases when they're ready to procreate. In other words, they're in heat. And if you've ever been around a dog or a cat that's in heat and the uh, males that it tracks, <laughs> that's quite powerful. Now, quick little story. How are we doing time-wise? We've got time. For many, many generations, people, men mainly, but people have been trying to find the human sex pheromone. It hasn't been found. But a number of years ago, I remember riding home from work and the radio said, oh, this group of scientists found that if you have this chemical, it will attract women. Yeah, right. Then a couple of years later, and this one was a funny one, they claimed the odors in males sweat, remember women perspire, but men sweat was a sex pheromone. Well, it hasn't. Now there is a sort of imitation and that's perfume is a female uh, imitation of the sex pheromone. And that's to attract the opposite sex. And also, if you lived in the Middle Ages, so you didn't, people didn't smell that you didn't take a bath that often. They didn't back in the 15, 1600s, but that was mainly the royalty who could afford that. Next time you put on a perfume or men cologne, you're putting on mainly a complex mixture of esters. And it's time to tell a personal story about Dr. White. And I, like a couple of my friends in high school, we had developed a bad habit. For whatever reason, we could get our mothers very mad at us by saying the wrong thing at the wrong time. And fortunately, I was good at it. And my father would come home and say, all right, what would you blurp out that got her mad this time? And he'd look at me like, Oh, come on, aren't you smarter than that? And the answer would be no. And it was just something I went through in high school. Luckily, I outgrew it in college, but high school was not a fun time between me and my mother. Well, my mother's favorite perfume was Chanel Number no. 5. If you're not familiar with that, that's a pretty expensive perfume. Very nice, too. And whenever I got in a doghouse, 
if you're not familiar with that expression, my mother was really, really mad at me. I would have to go, then it was called Marshall Fields, now it's Macy's, and buy a bottle of Chanel number no. five. And that always worked. She always forgave me after that because that was her favorite perfume. So the women at uh, Marshall Fields, this was in Skokie, in what was then called Old Orchard, still called that, it's now Macy's. Whenever they saw me coming, walking to them in the perfume counter, they'd look at me and say, all right, what'd you say to your mother now? How mad is she? How big of a bottle do you want? That stuff was expensive. For her birthdays, I'd try and get a nice expensive bottle just to have it on account in her mind. But that was my, that's my Chanel number no. five story. Next time you put on a perfume, you're putting on mainly a complex mixture of esters. I should also mention that probably one of the most well-paid organic chemists in all of business are perfume chemists. They make mega bucks. And because the perfume industry is very lucrative, the margins, meaning profits, are huge. And when I got out of grad school, even though I didn't work in areas of perfumes, I applied to one on the East Coast. It was Jivadon or someone else. And they sent me a nice letter saying, thank you, but you don't have the background we're looking for. I got into regular industry and things went well, but I at least tried. Oh, one other thing. Every once in a while, and I haven't seen the latest version, you will see commercials on TV. At one time it was for uh, cologne for men called or aftershave called canoe, do you canoe? And then there's one the last couple of years been Axe and they all have the same commercial. The guy puts them on, walks outside and all these beautiful women jump him. And no, it's not a sex pheromone, but they want you to believe that. And if you look at a rose is made up of all these different esters, volatile meaning it will, you can smell it. And rose, mother nature, like I said, is amazing, amazing organic chemist. And like I said, perfumes are mainly mixtures of esters. Now, if I've been giving you a headache and the switch is off for this, this is the structure of ester, of aspirin which has an ester here, carboxylic acid, and a benzene ring. Now, how that relieves pain, like in your head, if I'm giving you a headache, I have no idea. How to make it? Yes, I know how to make it. But that's another story. Now, how do you make esters? You use the Fisher esterification. And Emil Fisher, Dr. Fisher, is one of the great organic chemist, a German organic chemist. And this alone would be a lifetime achievement, except he's also known, which I'll talk about later, for even bigger achievement in working with simple sugars and elucidating, fancy word for figuring out the name of a uh, the structures of simple sugars. It also killed them, but that's unfortunate. I'll tell that story later. So how do you make an ester? Take a carboxylic acid. It's a derivative of carboxylic acid. React it with an alcohol, the presence of acid, and you make an ester. The R carbon and R prime with the hydroxy group is the carbon, this oxygen is bond to an R prime and the ester. And if I look at the clock, it's time to take a break. I actually went a whole minute over, so I apologize. And that means come back in five minutes at 156, thereabouts. I'm going to go take a stretch. I'll see you in five.
I haven't used this in a long time. Time to get going. All right, we we're talking about esters. And while I was stretching, I realized I forgot to talk about one specific ester. Now, I've been teaching you both IUPAC and common names. That's not what I want. That's what I want, the whiteboard. And there's one common name of an ester. that you should know. And that's the sester. Now the IUPAC name nobody ever uses would be ethyl ethanoid. But if you take that are used a common name for the carboxylic acid that would be used to make that. If this were an H, the common name is derived that way. And you should know this, hint, ethyl. And it comes from acetic acid, drop IC in the word acid. and add A-T-E, ethyl acetate, and use the IUPAC, drop the IC in order. And ethyl acetate is this molecule, the common name. And where do you find ethyl acetate? Go to any <laughs> big box store, go where they sell nail polish remover, and there are two types of nail polish remover. You should know ketone, acetone, is a nail polish remover with the ketone in it, acetone. Ethyl acetate is a nail polish remover with an ester. For many years, most of the bottles was ethyl acetate. It smells better. And if you have any cuticles or cuts on your finger, it doesn't burn as much as acetone. But in the last couple of years, where you use the new polymeric uh, nail polish, the stuff you put under the light to cure, acetone does a much better job taking it off your nails, removing it than ethyl acetate. So over the last couple of years, if you look at the number of bottles, there are now more bottles of acetone than ethyl acetate. You should know, what's the name of the sester? Ethyl, or how to draw it, Given the name, draw the sester ethyl acetate, and you should know that's nail polish remover. Now, we're talking about how do you make esters, and that's Fischer esterification. Again, that's named after the great German organic chemist, Emil Fischer. And you take a carboxylic acid plus an alcohol plus acid, H plus catalyst, and you make an ester plus water. But as you know, organic chemists, inorganic stuff, eh, I'm not going to worry about that unless I'm making a couple thousand pounds in a reactor, and you're not. All right, let's look at an example. And the question is, what's the organic product or products that are following? And you look at that and what functional groups, what's different? Carbonyl hydroxy group, R group, carboxylic acid. Carbon, ooh, and a hydroxy group, an alcohol called R prime OH, an acid catalyst, and what do you make? An ester. What's attached to the carbonyl? R prime is still there, oxygen and or R is still there, R prime. So what's R? Ethyl. What's R prime? Methyl. Two carbons, my carbonyl, oxygen. What's R prime? Methyl. Let me also mention 
the carbon, in this case, you don't have to worry about it, but the carbon in our prime with the hydroxy group is the carbon that's bonded to R in the ester. And that's, oh, wait, close your eyes. I forgot to put the hydrogens in. Okay, you can open them now. And that's your ester. Oh, let me have you have some fun. And the question is, give the organic product or product for the following. I see the thumbs coming up, but if you haven't finished, I'll give you a little time to finish. Try and give everybody time to finish. All right, let's get to work. If we look at here, the first molecule, what's different? Carbonyl hydroxy group carbons. That's a carboxylic acid. Second molecule, carbon, carbon, hydroxyl group on a carbon. That's an alcohol called R prime. And then acid catalyst. And when you react that together, you get an ester. And what's my R group? Three carbons. What's my R prime? Two carbons. So I have my three carbons, my carbonyl, my oxygen at that carbonyl, and two carbons is my R prime, and I'll put in the hydrogens. And you made that ester. And I worked for a company that made esters like this, not this one, but others. Oh, let's have fun once more. Let's do a little something different. What two things would you react with acid catalyst to make that molecule? Don't forget the lab you did last Wednesday is due today because we didn't have class on Monday. So don't forget to upload the ketones, aldehydes lab to the assignment area sometime today or you got until tomorrow early morning, get it done. Doesn't it feel good? You can do organic chemistry. See, it's not as bad as I said, it's fun. All right, let's do this. And the question is, what do you start with and react with acid catalyst H plus to make this compound? What's different? Ooh, carbonyl, remember, look for ox, uh, any, this chapter two, oxygen. Anything that's not carbon or hydrogen or carbon, carbon, single bond should get your attention immediately. I've got carbons on the carbonyl carbon. Oxygen, that oxygen has carbons. This is an ester. And how do we make an ester? We react the carboxylic acid 
plus an alcohol with acid catalyst. And what's my R group? Ethyl. What's my R prime? Isopropyl. Therefore, there's my R group. I'll have a carboxylic acid. And then my alcohol, the carbon with the hydroxyl, with the oxygen, will be the carbon with the hydroxyl group. So that's this carbon, isopropyl alcohol or 2-propanol. And that's how you make esters. And Mother Nature uses this reaction all the time. Next time you're out walking, you smell the flowers. Don't forget, smell the flowers on your journey through life. I always do when I go out walking. And you're smelling esters mainly. All right. Let's continue on. If you were reading the book, I don't think anybody is. We're skipping the mechanism because I just don't have time. I can do it, but switches off. I just want to mention you can have cyclic esters and they have the name lactones. And those are cyclic esters. Here's an example of a lactone. I will never put this on a test in this class. Now, you have an ester. What can you do with it? Well, you can react it with acid and water. And that's what this reaction is. You take an ester and react it. I can also write it this way. Acid and water, water, acid. What happens? you get back the carboxylic acid plus the alcohol you would have used to make that ester. Now, I think I might have asked this once before. If not, I'll do it now. And that is wherever you are right now, where would you find acid and water quickly? Your stomach. Your stomach, and I always think of this as one of the wonders of life, we all have cells in our stomach that synthesize, fancy word for make, hydrochloric acid, H+. And if you watch me, and you've probably done the same, you've been drinking stuff with water in it. So there's water and acid in your stomach. Now, I'll be coming back to this later in the semester, this is how your body breaks down fats and oils in your stomach, because all fats and oils, I'll teach you later on, are esters. So let's take a look at this reaction. And this is how your body starts digesting fats and oils. But for now, we'll stick to smaller molecules. Later on, I'll show you how it does it with fats and oils. And what do we have here? An ester. Carbonyl, oxygen with R prime, carbonyl with R group. Water and acid, or acid and water. And you get back the carboxylic acid you would have used to make that ester plus the alcohol you would have used to make that ester. So if I look here, here's my R group. Here's my R prime. The carbon with the oxygen will be the carbon with the hydroxyl group and the alcohol. And therefore, I get two things. This carboxylic acid plus this alcohol. And that's acid hydrolysis of an ester. And I can put the acid first or second, the water first or second. It makes no difference. 
what that tells you is there's a mixture of both. And it's your turn. And on a test, I would do this so you know there are two things you have to write down. And don't forget, give me a thumbs up when you're done. Or I haven't done. All right. It looks like everybody's thumbing up on me. It's, that sounds bizarre. <laughs> Never mind. I don't want to ever use that again. All right. Let's get going. What do we have here? Carbons, carbonyl, oxygen with carbons on to the carbonyl, ester. Reacted with acid and water, acid hydrolysis of an ester. You get the carboxylic acid you would have used to make that ester, plus the alcohol you would have used to make that ester. In this case, this three carbons is R. This is R prime, three carbons. Then my carboxylic acid group. A little out of sync, let me... That looked bizarre. I, I don't want to, that's better. And don't forget, there's four bonds to carbon. Then the R prime on the alcohol would be this, and you get ethanol. And that's how you do it. All right. So look at the clock. I stole a little time from you. It's time for lab. And let's do today's lab. Remember today's lab, the fact that it's Wednesday, even though my brain keeps on telling me it's a Tuesday because I put my garbage out last night, which I do on Monday nights. But because of the holiday, we didn't have garbage pick up on Monday night. So anyways, today's lab. Today's lab deals with carboxylic acids. All right, everybody see carboxylic acids lab on your screen? Thank you. All right. Now, the first part, we're going to deal with the solubility of carboxylic acids. And what you'll do if you were in a lab, you take a small test tube, fill it about halfway with deionized water. That's uh, water where the ions were taken out. And add a few drops of each of the carboxylic acids, or if it's a solid, a small amount of solid, you mix it. Never, ever was a never ever mix it this way hold the test tube one two three don't tickle it and you mix it we also have what's called vibro mixers you push it down and the plate starts vibrating and does a good job of uh mixing the test tube and if you have homogeneous solutions same throughout the the carboxylic acid is soluble if it's not, you see two layers, it's insoluble. Now, one of the things I don't have here, but for here, please draw the structure of each carboxylic acid you're using. And I have acetic acid, propanoic acid, steric and oleic, and 
you can find the structures on the internet using my favorite search engine, hopefully yours, Google. Next, we'll do the reaction, or you would, of carboxylic acids with sodium bicarbonate. And that reaction is this. Carboxylic acid, sodium bicarbonate, you get the carboxylate anion of the carboxylic acid plus the sodium bicarbonate forms carbonic acid, which breaks down to water plus CO2. And that's given off at a gas. That's what that arrow means. Now, when you add a base, to an acid, you get an acid-base reaction. And for those of you who forgot, you can measure what's happening with the pH scale. And we do this in the lab, our lab, with pH paper, and it changes color. Now at seven, you have a neutral solution. Below seven, it's acidic. And above seven, it's basic. And if you were to add a base to an acid, you'd expect the pH to go up. And maybe I'm lying to you. And here, we're reacting certain compounds with sodium bicarbonate, measuring the initial pH. And after you do it, the final, and what did you observe? Now. We've got some dangerous chemicals here we would have done in the lab, like lemon juice. Remember, that contains uh, citric acid. And tomato paste, that has citric acid. And you can see the results and what happens to the pH. And you can look at the results, uh, how to do that on YouTube. Now, this last one, where it says steric, Actually, we're only going to do it with oleic and acetic. And what you're going to do is two things. And I'm going to go to my whiteboard to show you those two things. Now, the first thing is you're going to take a carboxylic acid, either acetic acid or stearic acid, or no, oleic acid, I'm sorry and react it with sodium hydroxide. And this is a straight acid base reaction. And I showed you this already. And you will get the sodium carboxylate anion. Now, what I haven't showed you is the following reaction. If you take the carboxylate anion, this is one, then you'll do two. And don't forget, this is, uh, I should tell you, this is something you should write down in your diary. I'm going to balance a chemical equation, and we're going to react it with magnesium sulfate, which is really no, I don't need that. MgSO4, which is really magnesium plus two ions. And what you have is what's called an ion exchange. And you form this magnesium salt plus you make sodium sulfate. This is soluble in water. Now, Notice what we've done. Let's assume the molecular weight here is X. Over here, this thing approximately, the molecular weight is 2X. Now, does the molecular weight of R and what this magnesium salt would be play a role in water solubility? And the answer is, I'm not going to tell you. You go in the lab and find out.
And if we go back, uh, first of all, everybody done copying this down that wants to? It'll also be on the video too, in case you miss it, which should go up tonight or early tomorrow morning. All right, let's take a look at the lab. And what you'll do is in an Erlenmeyer, I, I don't know if you all know what an Erlenmeyer flask, it's a flask designed by the chemist Erlenmeyer to mix things nicely, it works well. And uh, you add some water, add a small amount of the carboxylate anion, the phenothalene is the pH indicator. You add enough sodium hydroxide till it changes color it goes from clear to pink, no, pink to clear. And I take it back, clear to pink. And then that means you've added enough sodium hydroxide to make the carboxylate anion. And you add some more bases to make sure you had enough. Let it sit for a while and record what it looks like. And then after that, you'll add magnesium sulfate and you'll record after you stir it, and you'll record what it looks like. And for acetic acid, the first edition is clear, the second one is also clear. But for oleic acid, when R is bigger, hint, hint, you get initially a clear solution, but when you add the magnesium sulfate, you get a white solid form. Now, in the lab, we use magnesium sulfate, how many of you have heard the term hard water? Hard water means in Chicagoland, mainly calcium and other salts that do the same thing. And this carboxylate anion of oleic acid and also would be stearic acid is what's in your bar soap. And let's go to this video. Illinois homeowners, if you have Sign a power meter like this in the side. For commercial. Now, when you have hard water or different, even it's not that hard water, here we have soft and hard. Hard means you've got more calcium salts, CA plus two, but in the lab, it's easier to make magnesium solutions. When you add to the soft water, a carboxylate anion, like from oleic acid. It's a little cloudy, but nothing much. But if we look when he adds a little more, can you see the solid on there? That's soap scum. And this lab, when you do this, for this one, you're making soap scum. And that's today's lab. Now, let me talk about one of the questions that students always get wrong. That's here, write the chemical reaction for each of the four experiments you conducted. What did you learn about the relationship of the sodium hydroxide and the carboxylic acid in water and also with the magnesium sulfate. What do I mean by the four reactions? Let me show you. Here are two reactions. Two of them will be when this is for acetic acid and three and four will be when this and this reaction is for oleic acid. And be sure you do that or you're going to lose points. And with that, well, we've had a full afternoon. And it's a lab day. And I can now say, I'm done. Gang gazun. I'll see you tomorrow. Don't forget, test number two will be after class tomorrow. Study the practice problems.
they'll be good for you. With that, bye. Gang is on. I'll see you tomorrow. If you have any questions, I'll have my office hour tonight from five to six on my Zoom office hour channel. Any questions of anybody before you leave? Going once, going twice. And by the way, Matt, you lucked out. You, you were right. You didn't have any calls to go to. Nope, hopefully no more either for the rest of the day. All right. Well, I hope so, because that way you can study if you want to, or whatever else you do. <laughs> All right, anybody have any last minute questions before I say Avita Zane des Morgan, which is German for actually, uh, it shouldn't be for Avita Zane this, this morning. I forgot what the German word for afternoon is, but Avita Zane, with that, if anybody doesn't have any more questions, I'm logging off. Bye.